Good morning. Y'all good? Excited to be at church? I like the woo over in the corner. Everybody just do that. One, two, three. Yeah, don't you feel better? Every once in a while, you got to let one of them out. If you don't, you get pent up and stuff. So I, I pray that you've had that kind of week, that every day you've had something to go woo about. And uh, I pray that if you haven't, that it starts today, that you begin having that kind of week. Here we are Sunday, the first day of the week where we get to celebrate what God is going to do. Not only what he's done in our life, but what he's going to do in our life over the next coming weeks. As I said before, school's starting this week. For some of you, that's really exciting. For some of you, <laughs> yeah. For some of you, that's not so exciting. Some of you got some of them starting off. Kindergarten, train wreck mascara stuff everywhere because they're going off to school. Others of you, you have junior high students and you're like, go to school. Get out. You know, wh wherever you are, uh, I just want you to know I'm praying for your students. I'm praying, and, and you do the same. Pray for our students here at Real Life Church. Pray for all the students, that God would use them in a mighty way, that there'd be a revival in our schools, that uh, teachers would be encouraged and strengthened and know that there is uh, a, a group of people praying for them as they kick off this school year. Today we kick off a new series called Connect the Dots, and I'm super excited about this because it's, this is something that you and I do every day. Now, when, when we were younger as children and we connected the dots on the little picture, it's pretty simple because there was always a number or a letter that went with it. You knew that one connected with two, connected with three, connected with four. Some of you outside the box type of creative minds that were like, I hate that. Let me just draw my own picture, and, and that's okay. God needs you to, um, but we know what that idea is like of connecting the dots. Uh, when I talk about connecting the dots over the next couple weeks, uh, it's going to be more like a cause and effect. If, if you start at this dot, there's an obvious next dot, and then one to follow, and then one to follow. It's basically a, a, a string of events that's put together. I, I'm an instructions follower. Any instructions followers in the house where, like, you're crazy about it, like I, I am, I, I, I read the instructions to everything. I am 39 years old, will be 40 in March, and I still read the instructions on oatmeal, on how to read, uh, how to make oatmeal. I measure out the oatmeal, and I get a dry measure cup for the oatmeal and a liquid measure cup for the water that I'm supposed to boil for the oatmeal. I not only do that with oatmeal, I do it with macaroni and cheese. Because there's a specific amount of water on the macaroni and cheese box that it says to put in the pan to boil. Now, some of you ladies are laughing at me, and that's okay. I got thick skin. I can handle that. Uh, but there's a reason they put it there. And so I'm kind of, I, I read the instructions. But in life, a lot of times, there's not, there's not what's next. Now, I'm going to ask you this. How many of you have been on Pinterest? Okay, raise your hands. If you've been on, put them up. I know some, some of the guys were like, I'm not putting my hand up. <laughs> and that's okay, fellas. All right? That's okay. I don't blame you. But I was, I was looking for kind of an illustration about connecting the dots and how sometimes, sometimes you can think you're doing everything right and it just not end up the way it should. Now, I saw this little breakfast concoction on, uh, online this morning. And go ahead, it's okay, you can all, I, that, that's a scoop of rice with some little rice chunks as ears and a little omelet blankie. I thought, man, I'd be like doing cartwheels down the stairs if I knew I had a teddy bear omelet every morning. Think about that, you're like, now, here's the reality. <laughs> this mom doesn't do this every day. <laughs> How many of you moms know that? Like those Pinterest moms make you want to shoot something, right? Well, so I see that that's, that's what would end up happening when someone else tries it. It's the same recipe, except they didn't have rice, so they thought they'd use broccoli because it looks furry. Now, I'm, go back to the old one and go back to the new one. Go back to the old one. And a new one. I'm just going to say something got lost in translation here. If I saw this every morning coming down the stairs, I might stay in bed. Something from point A 
to the destination got missed. And I want to start this series off today in saying that it doesn't matter where you are right now in your spiritual life or in your spiritual walk. God, I I don't know where you are. So wherever you are right now, I'm going to assume there's a destination that you have in mind. Now, obviously, there's this ultimate destination. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Amen? Uh, you don't usually find a lot of people that go, no, I'm good with hell. No, you know, that doesn't normally happen. They, they want to go to heaven. And, and even people that don't entirely believe in the idea or understand it completely, that's what they want to happen. They would rather that than even just lying in the grave and nothing happening. They want to go to heaven. But even if I pull back from that and go, while I'm here on earth, there are certain destinations that I hope to reach. One of those in my own life is I would love some peace in life, and some, some confidence in certain decisions in my life. Just I'd like to know that it's going to be okay. And, and sometimes in life, it, it doesn't feel like that. Y'all with me on that? Sometimes you don't know if it's going to be okay. Sometimes there is no peace whatsoever. And it doesn't matter what the church sign says, you know, we're, we're you no know, peace, K-N-O-W, uh, with Jesus, or no peace without Jesus, N-O. G- and so I, it doesn't matter what you put out there. It doesn't matter what you post online to make yourself feel better. Sometimes there's just moments where there's, there's no peace. There's no security. There's, there's, no, there's no confidence. And this world we live in is a tough place to survive. And so I want to talk today just a little bit about this idea of connecting the dots in our life. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be celebrating and talking about the, the land that we've got purchased to take our next step as Real Life Church. And we are super excited about that. I'm excited to share some more things about that, some stuff that's coming. we got life group signups that are going to be kicking off next week. And so you want to come and you want to start signing up for groups because you want to connect with people that you may not know. Some of you look around and you go, I think I know a lot of people that, that, that are here. That's awesome. We had a whole other service that was this full or fuller at 930 the people that you don't know. And life groups are a way for us to connect as a group at Real Life Church. We've got youth things that are kicking off this weekend or this Wednesday night. I've heard two things, that there will be a bonfire and there will be mud. Two things that are awesome as long as you're not the one washing the clothes. Okay, So students, I'll be talking a little bit more about that at the end of service. But there's some great stuff happening at Real Life Church. But in order to get to those things, we've got to establish some of the first dots to connect. So i got to start here. I've got to start in this one place, and i got to set it up a little bit. And here's how we set it up. You and I as human beings, we're flawed. We're broken. How many of you know you're broken? Say amen. Now, it's not something that's fun to admit. It's, it's not something that we like, we brag about. Hey, I'm broken. We don't do that. But the reality of it is you have to go back and understand why we are. And you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, and you see God created this place called Earth. And as he created it, he looked down and he said, okay, I need a manager for this thing. And he created Adam because God wanted community also. The Bible teaches us that God would walk with Adam in the cool of the evening. They're just hanging out, just talking. So he also looked and said, it's not good that Adam be alone. So out of Adam, he created Eve. So with that couple starting it all, God had this really nice relationship thing here that was going to be happening, and then he created something in them that was called a choice. He gave them the opportunity to either obey or disobey. And anytime you give a command or you give a restriction, we have the ability to say yes or to say no. God put a tree in the midst of the garden and said, hey, don't eat that. Adam and Eve acted like the rest of us and said, looks pretty good. And they went and had a bite of it. And from that point on, sin entered the world. And so we're flawed. You say, well, okay. If God created Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve messed it up, isn't it God's fault that they messed it up since he's the one that created it? I would say no. In that, as a parent, I understand that I want my kids to love me. I want them to love me. And so Jennifer and I, through our relationship, we've produced five kids. And those kids, not one of them is obligated to love me. Not one of them has to. Now, I can can make them do certain things. I can make them clean their room. I can make them put gas in their car. I can make them stand on their head if I so choose. But I can't make them love me. That's something that they choose to do. 
And I believe God wanted the same relationship. And I know this is true because if he looked at creation and said, wow, messed up on that one. He'd have just wiped them off. Adam and Eve, take two. No tree this time. Try it this way. See how this works. But he didn't. There was grace because he could have killed them. He could have just started all over. None of us would have known any different. But he didn't. He said, no, 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 no. He said, yes, there are consequences for sin. Yes, there are consequences for disobedience. But I love you. I love you. And he begins setting this plan in motion. And today I want to talk today about taking your step from this first place, this reality that we have, and this reality is this. Let me read this. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Romans chapter 7. I started trying to figure out how to connect the dots, and I begin to read and, and realize that Paul does a great job of it. So we're going to jump over to Romans chapter 7, and, and here's what we're going to talk about. The reality that you and I have to grasp and understand is just that. We are sinners. Some of us are really good at it, but we're sinners. This is what Paul said. He said, I have discovered this principle of life. It meant so much to Paul that he called it a principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Now, I love God's law with all of my heart, is what he continues to say. But there is another power within me. There's something else that's deep within me that is at war with my mind, and this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. So how many of you here, you know, you know that there are things that you know better than, yet you still do? You don't have to raise your hand, because I know. Because we all deal with it. We wrestle with sin. Here's Paul, the writer of the majority of the New Testament, confessing and admitting and being transparent that I wrestle with the fact that I am broken and I am flawed and this sin thing really frustrates me. The sin, and so you've got to understand, church, you want to connect the dots in your life? You've got to start in this one spot, this one dot, so to speak, that says the reality is I can't do this on my own. I cannot do life on my own. Somebody say, yes, I can. Then you're struggling with the sin that's called pride. You're struggling with the sin that lets you believe that you're enough, that you were all that in a bag of chips, that you got it on lock. You can handle it. And the moment you begin believing that, in the next moment, a temptation will come and take your legs right out from underneath you. Nobody gets married planning an affair. Okay. Nobody enters junior high and says, you know what, I'm pretty sure that if I don't graduate, being a drug addict is going to be a pretty good path for me. You don't do that. That's not what you do. It always starts with this sin of going, I got it, I can handle it. This won't affect me. This won't hurt me. It's only me that's affected by this, so it's on me. And that pride sin comes in and convinces us that we're enough on our own. And we are not. We just aren't. Paul realized that there's this war that goes on within me. And, and you guys know the war. You know there are things that you ought to do that you don't do. You know the things that you ought not to do that you may enjoy doing. So start with the reality. Start with this understanding, first and foremost, that we are broken, that we have this sin thing in our life, that we struggle with it. You say, well, how did we get that? Well, I'll tell you part of it. How many of you grew up in church? Show hands. Okay, cool. All right, so some of you are going to understand this, some of you are not going to understand this. We get this idea that, that we're, we're broken because we've been told that we're broken a lot. And so I grew up in church, and, and I can remember in church, growing up in church, there were certain unwritten rules. You guys remember some of those unwritten rules? No food in the sanctuary. That was an unwritten rule when I was a kid. No running in the sanctuary. Now, this was cool for me because I was a preacher's kid, and so what I would do when no one was looking, I would get the key, and I would go over to the church, and I would run through the sanctuary. <laughs> My mom is here this morning, so I'm confessing that. Hopefully, I won't get grounded, okay? 
But I would. I'd go run through, and we would play hide and seek in there, and we would run, and I would be in the baptistry, and I would, I, yeah, we, did, we played all over the church, running through it. Now, I used to think, what, who, who came up with that rule? No running in the sanctuary. Not once in my entire life, 39 years, have I ever seen a sign that said, no running in the sanctuary. But it's kind of an unwritten deal. And I'm wondering who the first guy that was started that. Hey, hey, hey! No running in there. What if that kid would have said, how come? I don't know. <laughs> but it sounds good. So we're going to stick with it. And churches from then on stuck with it. Don't wear white after Labor Day. I don't understand that. <laughs> I'm just being straight. I don't get it. Certain rules that we, this, this list of don't watch, don't dance. I'm not going to flash back into a footloose moment here, but you notice the two dance references there that I dropped, flashback? Okay. Um, I, I remember hearing these things. Here was the problem. I grew up in a home that loved to dance. Now my mom's going, oh, dear Lord, what is he going to say? We did. We loved to dance. My dad loved to dance. My mom loved, we loved to dance, and we were the preacher's home. We'd shut the curtains and dance because we loved to do it. But there was a part that you go, they found out we danced. And there's just, just this rule system that we went, where did this come from? And so what we did as Christians, and some of you may be dealing with this, and maybe you struggle with this as you keep going, well, if, if I could just do enough, then God would be happy with me because I know I'm broken, and I know I'm awful, and I know I'm a sinner, and I know I'm, I know I'm just trash, and I know I'm never going to be enough. The reality is you've never had to be enough. Did you catch that? I hope so. Because some of you, you need that freedom. You are living right now in bondage of trying to do everything just right. In fact, if you take one wrong step, you're in an eggshell environment where any one thing is going to make you feel so much guilt and shame that you don't know what to do. And Jesus said, it's never, me accepting you has never been about you being good enough. I died for you. The Bible says in that while you were yet a sinner, that was me. Jesus died for me. When I was at my worst, a lot of times people go, well, I'm at church. God, does, when he sees you, he doesn't see you sitting in your Sunday best. He sees you in the pit, in the gutter, and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, they don't know. They don't know they're broken. You've got to first get to the understanding and the reality that we are a broken, sinful people. But then the next dot comes open, and Paul begins to break this to us, and he says, wait, there's a realization that I have had. The reality is, is that I keep doing what I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I know I should do. What's the realization? The realization is this. this is, check out Paul's verse here. I love this way he says this. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Y'all ever have those days? <laughs> How pathetic am I? I can't keep my marriage straight. I can't keep my kids straight. I, I can't keep a job. I don't think Jesus likes me. I don't really think anybody likes me. So what do I do? Paul continues on. He says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And then he gives the answer, verse 25. He says this, thank God. Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want, some of you can relate with this right now, I really want to obey God's law, but because of this nature that I have, I'm a slave to sin. And I think that we struggle with that. Now, I want to unpack this idea of this realization, because see, what Paul says here is he doesn't really give the, the closing remarks. That happens in chapter 8. What he says is, I know there's an answer. I know there's... How many of you know Billy Graham? Raise your hand. Up high. If you know Billy Graham, raise your hand. Stick it up. All right, awesome. Some of you are lying to me right now. Um, because you don't know him. You know about him. You know about him. Some of you are like, no, no, Bill. Bill Graham lives two doors down from me on 3rd Street. And if that's the case, okay, you got me. All right? 
I wasn't talking about Billy down the street. I was talking about Billy Graham. I don't know him. I know about him, heard some great stuff. Guy preaches the gospel pretty plain and simple. Jesus Christ, him crucified, resurrection for the redemption of your sin. It's good stuff. But I don't know him. You see, I, I can know an answer to something. I can know something and not apply it, and it does me absolutely no good. Is it, we all know this. How many of you know how to lose weight? Some of you are not raised. You're like, nope, <laughs> not doing it, Vince. I know how. I know, I know if I would start exercising. I know if I would eat right. Now, if I just start doing a little bit of stuff early on, I would get stronger and could do more stuff down the road. I know. I know the process. I don't know everything about the process, but I know enough to get started. But I don't. I know the things I should do in my marriage to make it a stronger marriage, but not all the time do I do the things that I know to do to make it a stronger marriage. So you can have a realization but not actually do anything with it. You can understand, and this is where I feel that we are in this part of the connecting the dots as a church, and not just this church, but churches all over the place. People know that Christians or those that follow Christ have something that seems to give them peace and hope and confidence, but they don't really know how to get it because it's not shared with them. They go, okay, well, I'm going to start going to church. When, I, when we started Real Life Church, I'd have people say all the time, yeah, I know, I need to start going to church. Well, why don't you? I don't know. Well, you should come. Yeah, I know. I know. So will you come? I don't know. Maybe you'll see me there. Do you know you need to be there? Yep, I know I need to go to church. Well, why don't you come? I don't know. What are you doing? If you know... You've had the realization that there's something that the church offers that's going to benefit you. But, uh, you know, it just gets so busy. It gets so busy. I understand it gets busy. Well, I'm not convinced some of them church people are hypocrites. Yep. Some of us are. And you guys have heard me say this before. I figure you really only got two options with hypocrites. You can sit next to one in hell or you can sit next to one in church. I didn't figure I'd get a lot of laughs on that one. You can blame the reason you don't act on any multitude of things. But the reality is we just don't act. We know. I know how to lose weight. I know how to be a better husband and a better dad, just sometimes I don't. I know how to be a better Christian, and sometimes I don't. Then you're the preacher. You're right. Sometimes I don't. And so what is it? Paul said, I, I, what a miserable person I am. I know that I love Jesus. I know that I love God and I love his law and that he gave me this standard to live to, but I'm broken and so I can't meet the standard. So I don't, what am I going to do except trust in Jesus? And so the reality is, is I'm broken. The realization is, is that there's an answer. The one thing that I've understood and finally realized about an answer is you don't need the answer unless you ask the question. Well, what's the question? I don't know. For you. I know for me that I, I was tired of acting a part. Man, I had great church attendance, just didn't have a deep relationship with Jesus. I could nail it. I could sing the songs. I could quote the scriptures. But... I'd still struggle. I still wrestled within myself with temptation and sin and different things, and, and I just kept losing the battle, it seemed. So I stopped on realization. I stopped knowing all the answers but not going and getting them or not accepting them. And so Paul goes ahead and he gives us the remedy. There's the reality that we're sinners. There's the realization that there's an answer. But until you accept the remedy, it does you no good. There are a lot of people that are great people, good people, that don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people in churches, and even here. We invite people to plug in and get involved. You sing the songs, you show up for church, you got the t-shirt. 
but you may not have said yes to Jesus. Well, Vince, I'm coming to church. Awesome. I love it that you're here. I'm honored that you're here. But there's a Jesus who has done more for you than I ever could. So as much as I'm grateful that you come to church here, my heart breaks if you don't know Jesus. I've missed. If your first step, your first goal isn't a relationship with him. So Paul jumps, and this is a, one of those places in the scripture where if you get to the end of chapter 7, you kind of go, oh, it's Jesus, but what about him? You have to go to chapter 8, and it, it's just a continuation of chapter 7. In verse 1, he says, so now, there is no more condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. In other words, you cannot do this alone. You can understand there's an answer, but until you accept the answer, until you connect those dots, you still don't win. But Vince, I want to win. I want, we all do. I want to beat the temptation in my life. I want to win. I want to be more than a conqueror. The only time I get to do that is when I do what this verse says. Go back to verse 1 and 2, if you would. There's a special word in here, and it says it twice in the first two verses. Belong. So now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, he calls the shots. He's the one that says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the answer to all the questions. You say, well, I've got a lot of problems. He's the answer to all the problems. You say, well, how, how is it that simple? I don't know. I just know it's true. I believe that if the guy gets up from the dead, I'm going to listen to what he says. I believe if he looks down and creates this earth and the flawed part, the broken part, is as beautiful as what we get to live in every day, that guy's got some stuff that I want. That guy's got something that I need in my life. And it's up to me to connect the dots and say, God, I'm tired of being broken. I'm tired of knowing the answer, just not doing the answer. Out of laziness or just I'm afraid of what people might think or might say. And so we stay somewhere kind of stuck in the middle kind of like making macaroni you you can measure the water get your butter just right mix it all up but if, if you don't add some heat to it it's gonna be nasty right you just miss one element you miss one chain one event in the chain of events and it can mess up the whole thing when Jennifer and I first got married, we'd had hamburger helper. We didn't have no hamburger, so we just had helper. <laughs> Some of you can relate. You've been there before. Guess what? It don't taste near the same without the hamburger. You need it. It's a crucial ingredient in hamburger helper. For you to be a Christian, Christ is the crucial ingredient. You can't just go to church. Or you can't just try to do the right things. We'll always fail at that. We'll always mess it up. Today, guess what? This after, by the time I go to bed tonight, not purposely, not intentionally, there's a good chance that I will struggle with sin. Just like you. If I make it through today, it's going to happen tomorrow. If by chance I get two days in a row, then I probably ought to watch out for Wednesday. Because it's going to blindside me. And I'm going to blow up in anger. I'm going to try to control a situation that's not mine. I'm going to face temptation. I can't depend on me to live a life that only one person ever lived. His name is Jesus. And so what I do is I say, God, because I can't depend on me, I'm going to connect the dots. 
and I'm going to depend on him. And so Jesus, in my broken state, I'll follow you. In my flawed, sinful nature, I give it to you. And the temptations that come help me get through those. Your Bible tells me that I can be more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus, so I'm trusting you to help me win that battle. God, I, I can't make my marriage work just on my own merits. I, I'm, I'm just not good enough. But you are. You are Christ, and, and you are Jesus, and, and you make all things good according to Scripture. And so if my marriage needs that, then I'm going to be as much like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you, God, and, and so you help my marriage. God, I can't be the best dad. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to have a bad day at work and blow up on the entire family this week. Unless you help me. Unless you help me. God, I'm going to school and there are so many temptations to be this or to be that or to be accepted or to be uh, approved of. And, and I want them to like me and I want them to like me. No, 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 no. Listen, students, if you're here this morning, you got one person to impress. One. One. And his name is Jesus. His name is Je You say, well, yeah, but Vince, you don't know what it's like to be in school anymore. Yeah, I have no idea. It's been ages since I've been. Guess what? There were jerks in 1994, too. There were people that had unrealistic expectations, even in the 90s. We had better hair back then, but, you know. They had these expectations that said, well, if you don't fit in this box, if you don't fit in this box, then you're just not right. Or there's cool and there's, no, stop. The only box that you need to fit in is Jesus. And you know what? If I check that box and say, God, I'm yours, and I'm going to trust you to protect me and walk me through it, I'm all right. I'm all right. But Vince, that's really, really hard. Yeah. And I know some of you have been in church services where a preacher will stand up and say, if you'll just accept Jesus, everything gets easier. That's a lie. You're going to get tempted tomorrow. School is going to be tough this year for some of you. Some of you teachers, school is going to be tough this year. You say, Vince, I don't go to school. Work is going to be tough this year. You may get blindsided and not have a job tomorrow and not even see it coming. But if you'll trust in the one who says he'll supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, you'll make it. You'll make it. You're going to be okay. You can be more than a conqueror. You can be an overcomer. You can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives you strength. Read Philippians chapter 4. Go home and, and write it on your mirror if you have to. Just the whole chapter. It's good stuff. Because we need to know that if I'm going to connect the dots in my life, that I'm going to go from the center that I am, if I'm going to go from living the way I am, then I not only have to understand that Jesus is the answer, I have to, I have to receive him as the answer. And so I want you to bow with me right now. No one looking around, just me and you. Just me and you. How many of you just be honest with me for a second and say, Pastor Vince, I, I've been coming to church, but I don't know that I've ever just really said yes to Jesus. I, I've never said, Jesus, would you come into my heart? Forgive me, I'm a sinner, and I need Jesus. I've never done that. I just started coming to church and greeting and working in the cafe or parking cars in the parking lot. I've just been coming. Is that you this morning? And, and maybe you've tried to skip some of the, the dots that need connecting. Would you just do me a favor and lift your hand and put it right back down? Nobody looking around, just me and you. If that's you this morning, I see you. I see you. I see you. Come on. Vince, I, I, I'm just doing what I thought I was supposed to do. Come on, just lift it up and put it right back down. Yeah, I got you. The Bible says that today, today, 
is the day of salvation. And it's not complicated. The Bible says if we would believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Well, Vince, there's got to be more. No, 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 stop. See, God made a real simple connect the dots puzzle here. And too often we try to jump in the mix and complicate it. If you confess with your mouth, you've got to pray it, you've got to say it. And you believe in your heart. It's not just something that comes out of your mouth. It's down deep in your heart that you know that you need Jesus. And you believe that Jesus raised from the dead and that God sent him for you. You can belong to him. And when you belong to him, that's when you start to win. That's when you start to overcome. That's when you start to take these temptations and push them out of the way. That's when you start to take these insecurities and push them out of the way. That's when you start to take your marriage and elevate it and strengthen it. That's when you take your parenting and you set it up and you say, God, I can't raise these kids. I need your help. And he comes alongside. And yeah, you're still going to mess up, but you're never alone if you say yes. Several of you raised your hand. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray right now. If you need to come and do that now, you come on. You come on. Andy's going to play. No one looking around. I'm not going to come and get you. You say, Vince, I, I don't know if I want to come forward. I'm a little scared. Okay. Okay. But I'm going to pray. And if you do, you come ahead. Father, I pray right now that people would begin to move. Father, I pray that your spirit would begin to move in the hearts of those that raised their hand that said, I know that I need this Jesus. I know I've just been kind of walking through the dots and around the dots. And God, I pray that you'd convict them now to stand and move just to come forward. God, someone would meet them down here. Someone would answer that question that would give them and show them who Jesus can be in their life. But God, I pray that you'd begin to move in their hearts right now. That they'd come pray at these altars that are here. That they would slide out of their seat and say, God, today, today, today I connect the dots. Today I make this choice. And Father, I ask this in Jesus' name still no one looking around. You say, Vince, I want to do this, but I'm scared. Then me and you right now, me and you, everybody else's head bowed, me and you right now, look up here at me. Just me and you. I want to do this today. I want to do this today. I see you. This is what I want you to do. I want you to pray with me. I want you to say, dear Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner, and I need you in my life. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that God raised you from the dead, and I believe that one day you're coming back for me. Teach me how to live. I am. 